Good morning. We have general questions. Question one, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in implementing self-directed support in Glasgow. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Thank you, President Officer. Self-directed support is an important part of the Scottish Government's health and social care reforms. The change we want to see in Scotland is greater flexibility, choice and control for individuals and carers who need support in order to fully achieve our goal. A major culture change is required, and this will take some time. To help with this transformation, the Glasgow City Council has received £2.4 million funding from the Scottish Government between 2011 and 2015. A further £279,000 has been allocated for 2015-16. James Donnan. Thank the Minister for that answer. I have been contacted by a number of constituents who have worries about the way that the legislation has been interpreted by Glasgow City Council, including a belief that in many cases it is being used to cut budgets rather than for the benefit of service users. Can I ask if the Minister will meet with me to discuss further some of these concerns that I have? Minister. It will, President Officer, let me start with the bottom line. Uh, Self-directed support is not a mechanism for uh, delivering cuts the Scottish Government expects individuals' needs to be met by the local authority in accordance with the legislation. And implemented correctly, self-directed support can help uh, people to achieve better outcomes within whatever level of resources are available. There are a number of very positive examples of this approach, and local authorities should draw on these examples in their delivery of self-directed support. Uh, Mr Donnan will appreciate it is not always possible for the Scottish Government to assist with an individual case. I am sure Mr Donnan will uh, know the routes to uh, seek redress and is advising his constituents accordingly, but of course, I would be very happy to meet uh, with Mr Don to discuss any concerns uh, that he and his constituents have further. Michael Russell. I wonder if the Minister would also agree to meet with me to discuss the case of Achievement Butte, which is uh, being threatened by the uh, difficulties of self-directed support funding from our Garland Butte Council. There is a lot of support for self-directed support uh, across the community in Butte, but that will be eliminated if good organisations like Achievement Butte cannot survive. Minister, this is a question about self-directed support in Glasgow. I do think Mr Russell has gone a bit wide, but if you would want to respond generally, and that would well, be helpful. Uh, rather than incur your wrath, President, let me just agree to meet Mr Russell. <laughs> well, well done, Minister. Question number two, Kenneth Gibson. So, to ask the Scottish Government how many additional whole-time equivalent staff are employed in NHS Ayrshire and Arne compared with 2007 and what impact this has had on patient care. Cabinet Secretary Sona Robeson. The number of staff employed in NHS Ayrshire and Arne uh, as at December 2014 is 8,697 whole-time equivalent compared to 8,114 whole-time equivalent in September 2006 a 7.2% increase of 582.9 whole-time equivalent under this government. In the same period, there was a 56.8% increase in medical consultants and a 77% increase in emergency medicine consultants. Local patient care in NHS Ayrshire and Arne has undoubtedly benefited from this government's investment in staff, including a 76% fall in levels of C. diff infection in those over 65 since 2007, a 62% fall in levels of MRSA since 2007 and a fall in mortality ratios of 14.5% for Air Hospital and 34.2% for Cross House Hospital between the quarter ending December 2007 and the quarter ending uh, September 2014. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very full answer. Can she please advise the Chamber what the impact of reduced mortality has been on having so many additional staff on the number of patient lives saved? Cabinet Secretary. I can uh, tell Kenny Gibson that the impact on mortality has, has been uh, significant. The, the measures taken under the patient safety programme uh, have resulted in the data indicating that nationally 15,000 lives have been saved since data collection commenced. I think that's a testament to the significant investment, but more importantly, the very uh, hard efforts of our staff within the NHS. Question number three, Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many young people who left school in 2014 are not in education, employment or training. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna uh, From the school leaver destinations, initial return published by Skills Development Scotland, uh, there were 3,976 pupils who left from the school year 2013-14 who were not in education, employment or training in October 2014. That is a, a rate of 7.7%. Mr Rowley. 
I thank the Minister for that response. I know from the most recent figures available that there are currently 93,000 young people under the age of 24 not in education, employment or training. For me, this is a national scandal, particularly as under this government since 2007, 54,000 fewer young people under the age of 24 are attending college. I know the Minister has in the past stated that we should not focus on headline figures, but will she agree with me that we need to invest in our young people and give them the opportunities to gain the skills and get the jobs? And the best way of doing this is to invest in our colleges and training and in skills. Well, this government is investing in young people. We have better rates of uh, employment of youth than the rest of the UK. We have lower unemployment rates of young people than the rest of the UK and lower inactivity rates than the rest of the UK. And I think, uh, by all accounts, uh, those are achievements which should be uh, welcome. The figure that I gave of the 7.7% uh, uh, that are currently uh, needs that have uh, left school uh, uh, was 13.6% in 2007 8 uh, we have returned the figure to pre-recession levels and we have done that by sustained investment over a number of years. Uh, and that includes investment and refocusing uh, within colleges uh, where there are a considerable amount of work is being done uh, in terms of uh, young people's engagement at college level. And I'm very happy uh, to talk to Alec Rowley uh, in greater detail about this issue if he wishes to have that conversation. Question number four uh, is in the name of Mark MacDonald. For understandable reasons, he cannot be here today. Question number five, David Stewart. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with NHS Western Isles about the Well North and Keep Well programmes. Sir, Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government has maintained regular, regular communication with all NHS boards with regards to Keep Well throughout the lifetime of the programme. This has been managed through the Joint Managers Network and also via NHS Health Scotland, the Specialist Health Board, tasked with managing the programme on behalf of the Scottish Government. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, does the Minister share my view that staff in NHS Western Isles deserve praise and recognition for their first-class work in delivering the Well North and Keep Well programmes? As Chair of the Cross-Party Group, I am particularly interested in diabetes screening using a biochemically stable test, which means screening can be done at any time of the day rather than requiring a fasting sample. Will the Minister agree to draw this excellent initiative to every health board in Scotland as an exemplar of best practice? Minister. Uh, well, let me uh, thank Mr Stewart for uh, raising uh, this issue and acknowledge his long-standing interest in uh, the subject matter. Uh, I would always, I'm always happy to praise our uh, hard-working NHS staff, uh, be they in the Western Isles or uh, elsewhere in the country. I would certainly uh, agree that, of course, Keep Well has been uh, invaluable in demonstrating that uh, large-scale national programmes cannot be delivered in a one size it fits all uh, manner, uh, President Officer, and it's always going to be important that NHS uh, boards learn uh, good practice from one another, so I'll be happy to uh, draw that to the attention of other boards. Question number six, Linda Fabiani. To ask the Scottish Government when it will next meet the Scottish Police Federation. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. I meet with representatives of the Scottish Police Federation on a regular basis. Linda Fabiani. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the evidence given by the SPF to the Police Subcommittee referenced police officers falling foul of data protection legislation, including uh, the view of the Scottish Police Federation that the whole approach is just wrong. Since the case of my constituent was highlighted in the press, other serving officers have come forward. Will the, Minister, sorry, the Cabinet Secretary undertake to discuss this issue at his next meeting with the Scottish Police Federation? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I am aware of the long-standing case that um, Linda Fabiani has highlighted and also the evidence that was provided at the uh, at Justice Committee's uh, uh, subcommittee on uh, policing. Uh, what I can inform the member is that the uh, Police Scotland's Professional Standards Division uh, is presently working uh, with the Crown Office criminal allegations against the police uh, department uh, in order to consider some of the issues around the level of data protection at cases uh, which are reported to the Crown Office uh, and the amount that are not taken forward for uh, prosecutions. And my understanding is that they intend to hold further meetings in order to uh, discuss this issue further. Uh, the member may also be aware that the uh, Scottish ministers uh, don't have a role in police complaints and conduct issues directly. 
However, uh, the Scottish Police Authority have recognised that there is an issue around Data Protection Act cases with the timescale involved in dealing with uh, criminal allegations in general and also the impact that that can then have on individual uh, officers. Therefore, it may be appropriate for the SPA to ask Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, along with the Inspector of Prosecutions in Scotland, to consider undertaking a joint inspection process uh, to consider the whole issue of criminal allegations against the police. And I would be more than happy to raise that matter with the Chair of the SPA when I meet with him later this afternoon. Question 7, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on how long patients with type 1 diabetes should have to wait for access to an insulin pump. Minister Maureen Watt. The Scottish Government expects that all people who meet the clinical criteria and would benefit from insulin pump therapy should receive it in a timely manner. Diabetes teams invest time in ensuring that patients commencing insulin pump therapy are highly motivated to self-manage their diabetes and are fully prepared for the change in their diabetes management. This includes undergoing appropriate structured education. The length of time taken supporting the initiation onto insulin pump therapy is tailored to meet the needs of each individual. Sarah Boyack. Uh, does the Minister actually have a, a timeline, though, for how reasonable it would be for that process of education to take? Uh, one of my constituents has been informed by NHS Lothian that even once they've been selected for insulin pump treatment, they have to wait at least a year to wait a pump. Surely that's uh, an excessive length of time and isn't acceptable. Does the Minister have actual guidelines once the education process has been completed, how long a patient should have to wait to get access to an insulin pump? I'm told it's due to lack of specialists. And what plans does the Scottish Government have to actually look at this issue? And will she investigate this personally to find out what's at the root of this problem? Minister. Um, I thank uh, Sarah Boyock um, for uh, what she said, and I am certainly prepared uh, to look into that individual case if she uh, provides me with the details. Most boards have met um, the, um, the targets that they were set, uh, but I am certainly prepared to look into that particular case in Lothian for her. Question 8, Gavin Brown. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the spring budget revision. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Mr. Officer, as the member will be aware, I provided evidence to the France Committee during its scrutiny session on the spring budget revision yesterday. The Government has taken action, as it always does, to ensure that we maximise the effectiveness of public expenditure through in-year adjustments to the budget, which were set out to the France Committee yesterday. Evan Brown. Grateful uh, for that answer, Presiding Officer. Uh, when giving evidence to the Finance Committee yesterday on the spring budget revision, the Deputy First Minister said that there would be an underspend of around £150 million pounds in 2014-15. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister approximately what proportion of the £150 million pound underspend will be revenue and what proportion of that underspend will be capital? Cabinet Secretary. I would imagine that the uh, balance of the uh, revenue and capital split will be about probably eight to one in favour of revenue versus capital, uh, I would think would be the, uh, the breakdown of that. Uh, obviously, there's, uh, that, that's my best estimate at this stage. There, um, it remains some weeks in the financial year, and as Mr Brown will know, um, because of the uh, attention we, we pay towards maximising the effectiveness of public expenditure and to ensuring that we deliver the underspend that has already been factored into the 2015-16 budget, which Parliament has approved, um, that we are able to maximise the uh, resources we have available to support programmes for which Parliament has already committed expenditure. Jackie Beale. Um, given that money is so tight, I'm sure we're, we're all quite astonished to hear that there has been the scale of the underspend that there's been. Might I ask the Cabinet Secretary in what portfolio areas the underspend has arisen? I, I think the first thing I have to say is that um, Jackie Bailey um, perhaps needs to spend a little bit of time uh, scrutinising uh, the management of public finances, because if she believes it would be prudent for any finance minister to try to achieve 
an absolute balance to a, a very small amount of public expenditure when the, facility, when the facility exists to carry forward that expenditure and utilise it in the forthcoming financial year with absolutely no loss to the taxpayer. It illustrates, oh, it illustrates, it illustrates a pathetic understanding of public finance management by the Labour Party. And of course, Mr McMahon, Mr McMahon is deciding to shout from the sedentary positions about underspends. When I became the finance minister, that bunch of incompetents had failed to spend £1.6 billion. So they've got no position to lecture me about underspends. Question nine. Roderick Campbell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the use of e-cigarettes. Minister Maureen Watt. While electronic cigarettes are certainly, almost certainly less harmful than tobacco and may have the potential to help people quit tobacco or nicotine use altogether, their long-term impacts on public health are not yet known. The Scottish Government has recently consulted on a range of proposals to regulate e-cigarettes. These proposals aim to prevent young people from accessing e-cigarettes and limit their appeal to young people and non-smokers. At the same time, we intend to balance this approach against the potential harm reduction benefits to smokers if they are able to use these devices to quit tobacco. Roderick Campbell. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Whilst I'm aware the consultation response is still awaited, will the Scottish Government prioritise designating e-cigarettes as an age-restricted product to be purchased only by adults aged 18 and over? The, Minister. Scot the Scottish Government has been clear about our commitment to introducing an age restriction on e-cigarettes to protect young people aged under 18 from the health harms of developing a nicotine addiction and becoming accustomed to behaviour which mimics smoking. This proposal was included in our recent consultation and will be taken forward as part of the Public Health Bill. Richard Simpson. Can I thank the Minister for that response too, because juvenile use is obviously an important issue, but also the issue of the safety of the contents and the devices for delivery is important. Can I ask the Minister if she would talk to her colleagues about ensuring that there is adequate funding, at least for pilot inspections by trading standards officers who are currently under huge pressure because these devices can e explode and we need to be really on top of it from a public safety angle. Minister. I'm happy to undertake what Richard Simpson has asked and get back to him. Question number 10, Alex Johnson. I draw members' uh, attention to my register of interests. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to address the reported concerns of smaller landowners regarding its land reform process. Minister Aileen MacLeod. Uh, the Scottish Government believes that Scotland's land should be owned and managed in the public interest. A consultation on the future of land reform in Scotland closed on the 10th of February. Over 1,200 responses were received from a wide range of organisations and individuals, including a number of landowners, and we are carefully considering all of the responses as we develop our proposals for land reform. Mr Johnson. I thank the Minister for that answer, but she will be aware that a process that appears to be designed to deal with the fact that Scotland is owned largely by a few large landowners fails to recognise that the vast majority of landowners in Scotland are small landowners and that the policies being pursued by the Government's proposals will damage the structure of land ownership in many communities in Scotland. Will she reconsider these proposals to ensure that she does the right thing by these small landowners? Minister. Can I say to Alex Johnston that Scotland's land makes a huge contribution to Scotland's economy and society and the people of Scotland want Scotland's land being owned for the benefit of the many and not the few. Yeah. John Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, also declaring an interest as a farmer, is the Minister certain that the land reform proposals under discussion are ECHR compliant, bearing in mind the recent Salveston decision? In short, are these proposals currently under discussion fair, that is, fair to all the affected parties? Minister. Can I say to the member that we will also be consulting shortly on changes to our succession law, including the extent to which partners and children should be protected from disinheritance, where the distinction between heritable and movable estate is removed, and that means it would still be possible for our families to plan and agree how interest on ownership in farms should be passed on to the next generation. Thank you. Before we move to the next site of business, members will wish to join me 
in welcoming to the gallery His Excellency Andris Tegmanis, the Ambassador of Latvia to the United Kingdom. I move to First Minister's question. question.